Welcome back to building an application with Webcom BPS. This is part two, turning a prototype into an application with Designer Studio. Now, most importantly, have you already watched part one, prototyping with Designer Dust? If not, do so. We left off here in the portal, and now we're in Designer Studio, and we're going to open the application we exported from Designer Dust. It's right here, Purchase Requests. Now to turn this prototype into an application, we need to do eight things. We'll familiarize ourselves with everything that's there. We will set permissions based on the notes. We'll also configure the lookup fields. We'll do any calculated fields or field calculations. We'll clean up any workflow tasks that have been assigned. We'll change some field matrix in a couple of places. We'll turn those notes that were made into rules. And finally, we'll test the whole thing. The first step is to familiarize ourselves with what's there. At the top level is the application, which can have one or more processes. And it will also have a presentation layer with start tiles, reports, dashboards, that sort of things in the portal. Now, inside of a process, you will find usually at least one workflow. And that workflow will look something like this. In addition to that, you'll have the layout of the form and the field matrix that indicates which parts of the form are displayed at which time and how. Here's the data dictionary. We call it form fields. And under configuration, you might find a number of things. Usually the thing you want to look for are business rules and possibly form rules. That's an application. So let's move on to the next step, which is to adjust permissions. We've got notes on permissions right here and we're going to first change the permissions on the application itself. So let's go to user privileges. And one of the first things is whoever imported it is by default the application administrator. Let's change that to whom we really want to have be the application administrator. We'll search for users or groups that, uh, yeah, that group sounds good. Let's do that. And then we want to indicate who's allowed to use the portal in the first place. And so I, we have a group called users for that. That's perfect, let's use that. That takes care of the application level permissions. So I can delete that bit. Now we need to change the permissions on the individual process. So let's go to user privileges, change the business administrator to admins and decide who can launch new workflow instances, fill out new forms basically, that's BBS users. We'll also do access and edit workflow instances. In other words, who can see everything. So those comments from designer desk are now actual privileges. Now let's go to lookup fields. And there are several. There's one here called cost center. There's another one for supplier and a third one for item. Let's configure that first one, cost center. It's a choice field and the choices are coming from a data source and it's called cost centers. You can see it here. And if we click on that test, we can see what the values are at the moment. But we need to know a little bit more about this data source. It's a fixed values list. It's the example of the data we did before. Let's click on this arrow and change it because I don't want it to be a fixed values list. I want it to query actual data. We know this data lives inside of a SQL Server database. We've already got a connection established to it called TestDB. So now I just have to type in an SQL query and test it to make sure it brings back the columns we want. It does. Let's click close and we'll click save. If you want to know about how to create new connections, we have a separate video on that. Let's test it. Make sure it brings back the values we want. That looks good. And now let's go to advanced configuration. We're seeing some errors because the column names that existed before in our fixed values list, well, they aren't there anymore. We need to know what source column from the data source is going to stand in for ID and it's CC ID in this case. There's another column called CC name, cost center name, that'll stand in for name. And the third one description, well, actually we don't need that. Let's just delete it. We'll click yes, then we'll click okay. And We'd go to supplier and configure that next, and then go to item and configure that. But we'd just be repeating ourselves. So I did that already. In the real world, you'd have to do it yourself. Now let's cover calculated fields or field calculations. 
Here under documentation, you see that if we present a list of available items, we want to filter it by the supplier. Only show the items from that supplier. Now, the item catalog already exists. I'm just going to add a filter and we're going to use, well, let's start with the data source columns. I only want to filter, so let's look at the SID, that supplier ID. We'll drag and drop that into the rule editor. And now I want, want it where it matches the selected value for supplier. So let's drag an equal sign in there. And now we've got a place to drag and drop the form field named, let's find it, it's one of the line item columns. Now, there it is, supplier. Grab the ID from it and drag it into position. So now if the IDs match, if the supplier ID in the form field matches the supplier ID in the data source, it'll display those choices. Now that's our first field calculation. The next one we need to do is in each line item. You'll notice that when we select the item, we need to fill out a value for item price. And we prefer that to be looked up at the same time we look up the item name and its ID. So let's go back in here. That data source has got uh, the price in there. There's a column for it. It's called iUnit price. So we'll map that to a third column coming back called unit price, and it'll display that in the dropdown list. But we're also going to, when it's selected, copy that value into a, the target field called item price. So when you select it, it'll copy the value directly into that column. Quantity we fill in manually. Item total, we also need to calculate. So here's another kind of field calculation. We're gonna change it from a floating point number to a calculated floating point value. So here in advanced configuration, we will drag and drop a formula. We'll take the item price, drag and drop it up here. Then we'll go to operations and find the multiplication symbol, that's the star. Yep, drag and drop that next to it. And then we need one more thing, go back to the form fields and grab quantity. So this is going to be item price times quantity equals item total. I want to show it as an amount. It's already got the right number of decimal places, so we can click OK and it's, it's ready. But one more thing. This item total is just for one row in the line items list. I want the grand total of all the line items. And the way to do that is to have the item list automatically calculate the total and copy that total into another form field. So we'll take the column total for item total and copy it into the field named total. Now we can click OK and move on to the next step, which is workflow tasks. Let's go up to the workflow and that looks like it did in designer desk, but we need to make a few adjustments to it. Let's start by opening the submit path. In Designer Desk, we had made some comments as to how to calculate who's supposed to be assigned the task. That's been turned into a business rule, and we'll talk more about that later. The main thing is, we see that it's assigned to somebody, and I want to make sure that somebody gets notified, so I'm checking this checkbox called Send Standard Email. Now we can click Close and move on to another path, specifically this one called Approve. Comes out of Cost Center Review. Let's open this. And you can see that it's assigned to the current user, and you might not want that. By default, Designer Desk always assigns it to somebody, the current user. But in this case, when it's finished, it's not really assigned to anyone. It's still in a report, but no one's task list. Now let's open the reject path. And here we definitely do want it to be assigned to go back to the author. So we'll click send standard email to make sure we're notified. But I'm going to parameters. If I'm rejecting it, I don't need the form to be validated, but I do need to require a comment because you can't reject it without explaining why. That's just not right. Okay, let's close this. That looks good. Let's move on to this withdraw step. So if the author decides to give up and they don't want to do it anymore, again, it's finished. No one should be assigned that task. And similarly, if uh, we don't need to validate the form if they're going to reject it, now nah, we don't need a comment. If they're choosing to withdraw, they're withdrawn. Let's click close and we're done here. All tasks have been configured correctly. What's the next step? Field matrix. Underneath the workflow 
is the form definition, and under the form there's field matrix. You've seen this in Designer Desk, but we need to enhance it a little bit. You see these areas where there are read-only things? That's what we call a hard read-only. And we're going to click it once, so it changes from a checkbox to a dot. That's going to be a soft read-only. See, the definition is right here. Read-only cannot be modified except by JavaScript. Well, rules and calculated fields, we use JavaScript to do that, so we do need to allow it. So we're going to change, certainly, total to be governed by soft read-onlys. And in fact, we're going to use soft read-onlys everywhere. If you're not sure to use hard or soft, just default to soft. There are times to use hard read-onlys. This is not one of them. Soft read-onlys work everywhere here. And now, let's configure rules. All of our notes with special instructions get turned into business rules. You can see them right here. We've got one called Submit Task Assignment that determines who's going to be the approver. And the note is right there, and it's defaulting to the current user login and name. If you want to see where this is being used, you can follow this hierarchy. In fact, let's flip over to the workflow and just take a look at it. It's in the Submit path. We open it up. There it is. You've seen it before. Yep. That's it. Let's look at the other rule, withdraw path visibility restriction. That's being used in the withdraw path. Let's take a look at that in the workflow. So open up the withdraw path and we can see there's a availability restriction on the form. We only want it to appear under certain conditions. So let's go back to that rule and edit it because it's defaulting to positive. It's got a default value of positive. We want that to say only if the form was previously submitted. Well, the easiest way to know if it was previously submitted, it will have what's called an instance number. That's the human readable ID, not a GUID, not an integer. Uh, it, it's a meaningful looking ID. You'll see it right here under system fields. So let's drag instance number here into the rule editor. And what I want to do is also drag in an operator. This one is going to be not equals. And what I'm testing for is that it is not equal to empty. In other words, if it's not empty, there is a value. And we're only going to have an instance number if it's been previously submitted. Now, this other one, uh, submit task management, currently it's defaulting to the current user because we had to have a default value. We're going to do better than that. Here, we're going to do a data lookup. Let's go to integration and look at the function called data source value and drag that into position. And then we're going to click on the little ellipsis there and edit the data source value. This data source we're going to query is the one called cost centers. And then we're going to return the value called owner, CC owner, cost center. And the filter is going to be where the ID of the cost center and the data source is equal, let's grab equals, yep, drag that in, where it's equal to the form field called cost center and the ID embedding. So we're good. There, that's it. So if we find a match, we grab the value of the owner and return that. So let's save and publish because we're ready to move on to testing it. We need to go back to the portal for this. And then we're going to go to that application, purchase requests, and click on the start button. There's our form. Let's fill it in. Let's choose a cost center. There we see ID, name, and owner. There we go, marketing. And now let's add a couple of line items. Uh, let's see, we'll choose Delta as the supplier. There are the line items for Delta. I need to choose a quantity. And notice that the item total was updated and the brand total is updated. Everything calculated correctly. So we're in the not yet submitted state. Let's click the button marked submitted. And there it is. You can see that it's assigned to Alice. Alice is the owner of that cost center. So let's slide over to Alice's desktop, and there's the notification message that she got. There's a form with all the fields here, but we can click on a button and go straight to the form. There's everything. It's read-only. She just needs to make a choice to approve or reject. Let's have her approve it. 
and then it's gone on to complete it. So it works. Give it to your users. You're done. Thanks for watching this video and for more information, webcon.com.